everybody and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Melissa and I'm going to be your host for today and I have with me Rob Finn who is going to be talking to us about HEMA. Okay, so I am going to hand over to Rob now and he can run us through what he wants to tell us about HEMA. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so my name is Rob Finn. I uh, am a team leader at Emble EBI. So I look after the Sequence Families team, and within that team, there are a whole range of different resources. So there are the Protein Families resources, Interpro and PFAM, the RNA resources, RNA Central and RFAM, and I also look after EBI's metagenomics analysis platform called Magnify. That's quite a diverse, different set of resources, but actually the unifying thing deep down is the fact that we use probabilistic models uh, for annotating sequences at scale. So uh, my webinar today is to, to talk about that one of the core algorithms we, we have and to talk about the website. Uh, and I'm going to, so I'm going to talk to you about fast sensitive homology, homology detection using Hammer. So why, why are we interested in doing, you know, sequence similarity searches? So uh, in this a uh, little cartoon of how I'd like to represent sequence space. If you look on the left-hand side, we're trying to represent sequence data. So at the apex of that triangle, there are a few model organisms that represent a tiny fraction of sequences. Uh, on the right-hand side is, is the sort of amount of information uh, associated with those. Now, these aren't drawn to scale. This is very much a cartoon. But what we, we find is that in the literature, the most experimental information is known about the few sequences in the model organisms. And as we go down that, that uh, triangle on the left-hand side, we have uh, reference proteomes where there can be information. But then as we go down to complete proteomes and all these other sequences that have appeared in uh, databases like Uniprot, which are the comprehensive uh, protein repository, what, how much information is known about those is very little. And actually, as we proceed through the, the complete proteomes and these other sequences, virtually all of what we know about those sequences is computationally inferred. So as an aside, and, 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 and just to highlight some of the issues that the field is facing, uh, I, I'm just going to present some new data from, our, uh, from Magnify, the metagenomics resource. So in the insert diagram, you've got two lines, a blue line and a red line. And this is showing the growth of the protein, non-redundant protein databases from metagenomics compared to the growth of Uniprot. So Uniprot is shown in, um, in blue and red is the magnified database. Now, the magnified database has just exceeded 1 billion non-redundant protein sequences. And these have all come from uh, metagenomics data sets are typically environmental. And because metagenomics doesn't require uh, culturing of an organism before sequencing, it's giving us access to a much wider and diverse range of, of sequences. And if we want to annotate those, we need very uh, fast and sensitive tools. In the other graph, you'll see four different colors that's showing you that whilst metagenomics it can lead to some fragments as shown by that red peak. There are lots of sequences that are full length, that blue area, and near complete sequences, the green and orange. And so that's the breakdown of, of that 1.5 billion sequences. It has an, those sequences have a mean length of about 205 amino acids, which is actually not bad. However, if we compare that to Uniprot, less than 1% has an equivalent sequence to Uniprot sequence. But interestingly enough, PFAM, which is a protein family databases, database that uses profile hidden Markov models, is able to annotate 58% of those, even though they've come from a very diverse set of sequences. So what are we trying to do when we try and trying to align sequences? And, and when I'm talking about aligning sequences, I think my, my world is very much on that sequence as a string, so what's shown in the bottom right-hand corner. But we can also think about protein sequences 
and actually their three-dimensional structure. So, so what are we trying to do? Whenever we're trying to align two sequences, we're trying to bring the amino acids into register such that two amino acids that appear in one column are, we believe, are equivalent. And they are equivalent in terms of they occupy the same three-dimensional space or they occupy the same functionality. And so what we have is you can have a multiple sequence or a pairwise sequence alignment that can drive a structure alignment. In this case, uh, you've got the structure alignment on the top left-hand side, or you can have a structure alignment that drives sequence alignment. Now, there is no right or wrong of which one's better or the other. Uh, there are just far fewer structures, and you could argue that often structure gives you better alignment on very distant, uh, si distantly related sequences. But really, the whole idea of what we're trying to do is once you bring these amino acids into register, whether that's three-dimensional space or within the sequence alignment shown on the right-hand side, we can then transfer annotation. So on the asterisk, the pair of asterisks, you can see that, that they are uh, around position 120. You can see that actually at that position, those two amino acids are invariant. And so that may indicate some conserved function. So why are profile hidden Markov models uh, so sensitive and why are they why, and how do they achieve that so so really there's two parts now the, this is going to go into a slight uh, little bit of technicality but I'm going to keep it fairly light so so one of the, the key thing that the profile hidden Markov models do over similar algorithms like blast is that there is the full statistical inference that accounts for uncertainty now that seems a bit of a strange term and I'll come on to what that is and also compared to methods like BLAST, profile hidden Markov models use more information. And again, I'll explain what that means. So what is this strange statistical inference accounting for uncertainty? So let's think about what we're trying to do, uh, first of all, and, and what, what we're trying to actually achieve by this search. So what we're, we're trying to do is say, it's ask the question of what's the probability that a target sequence, so in my query database, it is actually similar to my query sequence. So, that, so we represent the target database as T and Q is the query uh, sequence. So what's the, what's the probability of my uh, target sequence matching my query given some sort of model of homology? But we've got to take the uh, odds ratio of that compared to the target sequence actually just being a random by chance match or this model of non-homology. So that's what we're trying to do. So that's our sort of null hypothesis. And let's just make that a little bit simpler for, for display purposes. So you've just got what's the probability of your target given H, that homology, versus target of random noise, R. And to get a score out, we actually take the log odds ratio of those two probabilities to get a score out for, for our sequence. So what we're trying to do and, and how do we actually achieve getting that score is actually having that model of, of homology is actually quite hard. And so what we do is actually do an approximation. So on the bottom right hand side is actually how we try and align a, a query and target sequence. So along the x axis would be your query along the y-axis would be your target. Where there's a diagonal, that means there's an equivalent position. And where there's a horizontal, that means that there's an insert in one of the sequences, in this particular case, uh, your um, target sequence. So to achieve this notion of, of uh, homology, how do we infer that normally we're so, or, or, we're looking at how those sequences align, and that's how we use our estimate that something's good. So what we actually do in reality is, is we, we have to take the joint probability of the alignment into account. So to do that, we have this little pi O, and that just says the O represents the optimal alignment or the best alignment. However, taking the optimal alignment is only an approximation. It's, it can be um, not the best alignment, or, or it may not be the only alignment. And this particularly is true when it, we 
we start having very distantly related sequences. So in this toy example, I'm showing you that there are actually multiple different ways for, for the same score of aligning the, the same query and target sequence. And you'll see in the middle this little toy alignment. Now, if you look at that, you can say, is that isoleucine correctly aligned in this particular case? So at the moment, it's being aligned underneath the histidine. Now, if we use the blossom matrix as an approximation for probability, and we look at what at the score for an isoleucine versus a histidine is, we can look that up here, and it's minus three. So that's not great. So what happens if we move that isoleucine into register underneath the arginine? So we go again, look at the isoleucine under arginine, again, it's minus three. So you've got exactly the same way of, well, you've got exactly the same score from those two different alignment positions of the isoleucine. So that's where taking the optimal alignment breaks down. So what Hammer does is that actually takes all possible alignments. So if you look at the top of page, and this is taking the maximum scoring uh, optimal alignment, and that's what essentially is for Turby. But profile HMMs allow us to go uh, and do the full forward uh, backward algorithm that takes into account all possible alignments. And that's represented by this sum of alignments here. And what that gives you is much better statistical inference. And so this is what BLAST is doing in terms of roughly taking the optimal alignment, whereas Hammer is taking into account all possible alignments. The way that I like to think of this is if you asked one person in a room the length of a table, they'll give you an estimate. And sometimes that can be accurate, but sometimes they can be wrong. But if you ask 30 people in the room what they, the length of the table they think, if you average all of those out, you're probably much closer to the actual length of the table. So that's the statistical inference accounting for uncertainty, so this alignment uncertainty. So how do they use more information? So here's a, a schematic of actually what a profile hidden Markov looks like. This is down, showing down the bottom. And then at the top, we've got this multiple sequence alignment. So uh, of four sequences. And we use that multiple sequence alignment to do what we refer to as train or build this profile hidden Markov model. So the question is, is how do we go from this alignment to this model? So let's walk through it. So let's look at this alignment in just a little bit more detail. So the first thing that we do, or what software does, is to assign consensus columns. And really, you can think of this as quite a simple approach. There is some sequence weighting, which I'm not going to go into. But in this particular case, the sequences are very different. And so there's some, what it does is it just says, What's the occupancy within those? And if it's more than 50% in that column, then we'll consider that as a consensus or an important position of alignment. So I've just marked it up to show in this orange color that they are the consensus positions. However, if you look at sequence three, that contains uh, a gap between the third and fourth, uh, sorry, amino acid between the third and fourth consensus column. So this is considered an insert because it's less than 50% and we have an extra amino acid. Now, if you look at sequence two and look at the uh, consensus column four shown here, there's a red dash. Now that is what we refer to as a delete. So there's a missing amino acid in sequence two compared to the consensus. And that's simply because there's more than 50% occupancy in this column but in sequence two, there's an amino acid that's missing. So that's assigning matches, inserts, and deletes. And then what we do is we look at the frequency of the amino acids and convert those into probabilities. So we go back to this diagram and we'll walk through. So the first amino acid, well, the first consensus column consists of small uh, amino acids. And the height of the letters above this orange box to indicate that that's a match position or consensus column is indicative of the probability we, that we assign. Now you'll see that they're not got exact, they're not all 25% of the total height. 
what we actually do is we actually adjust the weighting based on priors, how frequent the, these amino acids are, are known to occur. So you get this slight adjustment. The next two columns are fairly invariant, or are invariant. So they have a cysteine and a glycine, and we, we expect those with, with high probability. Then comes the interesting part of alignment. So at the moment, I've only been going from match to match to match. And I've not been looking at any of these other states, but this is where we get into the interesting part of the alignment. So let's take the case of, of sequence three, this insert. So here we've observed one amino acid that's been inserted. So we, we up the probability, which is indicated by the slight increase in weight of the white line, to go into this insert state I3. And this arrow indicates how long you'd stay in there. So it's not very long, so it's not very heavy. And then you go back out. You can go back out into the match position four. However, sequence two, you'll notice, actually skips that position four. So we go from position three, M3, to M5, so position five. And so you do that by going through a delete state. You only ever go through one delete state relative to one consensus position. So there's no arrow like on the insert state. So that allows us, let's look at uh, column four, the consensus column. We've got three amino acids there. Uh, they're all fairly sort of bulky hydrophobic amino acids. But the keen eyed will notice that there's a tyrosine that's just come in at a low probability. That's not observed in the alignment, but we know that that's a common substitution. So we can weight that with the prior such that you can actually accept tyrosine in that position as well. So the final column are sort of uh, polar charged amino acids, uh, and they have roughly the same weight, and then we uh, finished the model. So there you've got lots of different ways of going through the model. Now, the thing is, is that I've colored in blue a high scoring sequence that can be produced from this going through this um, profile HMM that we've not observed before. And that's really one of the key things in terms of the profile HMMs and capture the uh, sequence information, the evolutionary information that's happened uh, to, amongst that set of related sequences allows us to, to, to model the probabilities of how that may look like. Now, one of the key things over other algorithms is that this weighting of inserts and deletes is fundamental. And, and so if the alignment is good, these tend to go into loops if you're thinking about a structure rather than in the middle of a helix. Algorithms like BLAST use what we refer to as a fine gap open and, and extend penalty. So you've got equal chance to open a, a, a gap and extend anywhere in the sequence. And that's not actually true of what actually happens in biology. So here's uh, a, a, an anecdotal example using the Globin superfamily, just comparing uh, hammer and blast. And so we're using, to make the searches equivalent, we're comparing side blast and hammer. So on the left-hand side and top corner uh, is the structure of a globin, just that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Then in the middle is a representation of the globin superfamily. Uh, super now there's lots of different globins out there. So there's the alpha and beta hemoglobins and the myoglobins. So Alpha and beta are separated by about 300 million years. The myoglobins are separated by about 550 million years. And then more distantly related are neuroglobin, plant leg hemoglobins. And they've got up to about a, a thousand million years or billion million years um, distance. And then there's some really distantly related uh, bacterial homologs. And we know this now from, from established structures that these are definitely related. So if we start these searches with uh, three uh, hemoglobins and one myoglobin, and we make an alignment of those and start side blast, so they, all of those representatives have just come from that top part of the tree. And what you find is what you pull back is that top part of the tree. So what you get from side blast is pretty much what you put in. However, if you compare hammer, which is shown in the right hand, columns and different sequences with different e-values, what we can do is we can reach out and quite 
convincingly match neuroglobins and plant leg hemoglobins, and weakly match, I would consider this still a significant match, those distantly related uh, bacterial homologs. And so this is really showing you that even though you haven't started right up in this space, of, of, although you started, sorry, right up in this space of hemoglobins and myoglobins, HAMA is able to reach out and detect those very distantly related members. The graph down the bottom uh, left-hand corner, I apologize for the resolution of this, this just shows plots the same sequence and the E value given by Cyblast versus Hammer. And what you'll see is if, if Cyblast and Hammer were seeing that with exactly the same uh, degree of confidence or statistical significance, they'd be on the red line. But what you'll see is everything shifted towards Hammer. So that's seeing it with more significance. And down the, the left-hand side, there's some green dots. And there are 87 examples where Hammer's picked up a globin where it's been completely missed by Cyblast. And this is just an anecdotal example on a relatively small database. But the protein family world has predominantly used profile HMMs because of this ability to model these very distant relationships. And one of the key things now is that Hammer 3 is now faster than Blast. So within my team, we have a whole bunch of tools related to this. This is an example of something called 3D Patch, which allows you to take a profile HMM or a query sequence, search, find, find a set of representative sequences, have that uh, profile HMM being built, and then to use that profile HMM to mark up a known structure. So here we've got a hemoglobin and the part of the structure that's marked up is in that sort of yellow orangey color. And the darker the color, the more conserved the positions are. So what you can actually see is, so this is the same structure just rotated around the uh, axis. You can see a number of residues that are very dark and they actually correspond to the histidine residues that are responsible for binding the heme moiety in the globins. And you'll see this very much. And you'll also notice that where helices come into close contact, both with the ligand and each other, you generally see a greater pattern of conservation. And this is really just showing you that those important residues that Hammer sees actually do relate to uh, biology. So going back to Hammer, there, there are four different algorithms with a Hammer suite. There's, a, there's an algorithm called P-Hammer, and that it takes a single sequence and searches against protein sequence database. Now the sensitivity of this is not much better or different to BLAST because you don't have the information from multiple sequences. It's other algorithms that use this additional information. HMM scan allows you to take a single protein sequence and query that against a collection of profile hidden Markov models such as generated by protein family databases such as PFAM. And so that can annotate the domains on a sequence. HMM search allows you to take a multiple sequence alignment. In the web server, we allow multiple sequence alignment to be uh, uploaded. If you're using the command line, you have to first build that profile HMM. But HMM search then takes that profile HMM and then searches that against the sequence database to find distantly related members. So you're there taking one HMM and searching against lots of sequences, whereas HMM scan takes one sequence and searches it against lots of profile HMMs. Jackhammer is uh, an interesting thing in the fact it, it uh, combines the functionality of a P hammer or, and an HMM search, and it's an iterative search. You start off with one sequence, you then search that set, search the sequence database, and all the significant matches are then used to build a new profile HMM, that new profile HMM is then in turn used to search a sequence database. And this is very good. And this is typically what it follows a sort of approach that the protein families uh, adopt of taking a, a set, small set of representative se sequences and then iterating out. So if you want to find out more, there are a number of different uh, publications out there. So there are two publications on the Hammer web server, which I'll briefly demo in a minute. 
And there's also a, um, pro uh, an article in Protocols in Bioinformatics that guides you through the use of the website in a lot of detail and, and has a lot of different use cases and, and allows you to follow this, uh, follow uh, the outputs and what all of those outputs mean from the website in, in a lot more detail than can be covered in this webinar. So there's lots of people in my team that give rise to the protein families and uh, Hammer web server. They're listed on the left-hand side. I also collaborate with Sean Eddy, who's the primary uh, developer of Hammer, and also Travis Wheeler, who actually uh, has implemented the nucleotide version of Hammer and Hammer. Now, I haven't spoken about that much here. It's the same principle as we apply for proteins, but your alphabet is obviously smaller, so you don't have the 20 amino acids, you have the four nucleotides. So on to the demo. Okay, so I'm going to show you just a few canned examples, uh, just such that I know that they'll work and that there'll be no glitches with the network. But, but feel free to play with uh, Hammer uh, via this URL. So I'm going to switch to my web browser now, hopefully. And if all fails, I've got some backup slides. So here, we, I'm, in this particular example, I've run a single sequence against a, all of the prof profile HMM libraries we have available. And this graphic shows you how those different protein families actually relate to one another. So some uh, databases very much focus on trying to represent the domains within a uh, protein, so PFAM, Gene3D, and superfamily, and that's shown here. And actually what you'll see is there's pretty good agreement of them uh, between the different member databases. Some don't have other domains that, that say, for example, the green one that PFAM has is not found in the other databases. And that's because those other databases use structure to guide their domain definitions, where PFAM only uses sequence, so there's two other databases, TigerFam and TreeFam, and they tend to model protein families of full length. And so they tend to be smaller because they're matching the full, full length, but longer in terms of the information. Below are all the tables are showing you those hits, and there are various icons where you can link out to other uh, resources at the EBI. If you mouse over an individual uh, domain or entry from those protein family databases, you can link off. That little model match shows you how much of the model has been covered by that sequence. So in this case, the whole model has been uh, covered. If you look at the purple, you'll see that there's a jagged end and there's a little bit of a, 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 a little nick where it hasn't quite gone all the way to the end of the model. So it's not a quite full length match. And you just need to be aware of that if you're trying to design a construct. And that's quite common. This little lollipop at the end here indicates an active site position that's being predicted by PFAM. There's also transmembrane uh, indicators in this particular case. So I'm going to show you some search results from Jackhammer. So this so when you come to the site, you'll come in on the front page like that. If you want to choose one of the individual algorithms, you'll click search. So I'm going to show you the results from Jackhammer. So how would I go about running a Jackhammer? I would go to Uniprop, take my favorite sequence in FASTA, paste it in, and then choose my target database. And then I would set my e-value thresholds there. I've run one of these beforehand, and I've actually done two iterations so we can show you uh, some of the features. So let's go and have a quick look at the first iteration. So here, in this particular example, this is a single sequence at this point in time against the sequence database. And here we're showing you all of the different matches. Now, if you really saw quickly, this is actually the same sequence as my query sequence. And I've use this customized column to put on some additional fields. So I put this hit position on. So that shows me how the two sequences align. I've also put on known structures and the kingdom and phylum columns. 
And that gives me a complete table of matches. Now I can look at the alignment. I'm just going to drift down slightly. So if I was interested in human versus pig, I could see how those two sequences align using that little arrow. And here, those are very, very similar sequences. When you run with a single sequence, you also get the domain annotations. But because we hit so many sequences, it can be quite hard to digest and understand exactly how everything looks and feels. And so we allow you to drill down and, and, and reorientate those results. So they were initially listed by score. In this view, they're actually listed according to taxonomy. And you can use this as a particular filter. So if you were interested in only looking at the core date examples, you can click on that node and then you can scroll down, you can see all the species, and then you can just view the scores for that set. You can also group all of the sequences according to their, what we refer to as their domain architecture, the, the series of PFAM domains we find on the target sequences. This always takes a little time to load because you've got to go through all of the results. And here we go. So in this particular example, the top match is actually the same as the architecture we search with. And that's what's indicated by the red background to this box. So that's a sequence with a single globe in domain. And that's where the majority of matches were. But there are also 29 sequences that have two globe in matches. And although this is not the most exciting example, looking at how these different domain organizations appear is often quite informative about function. Let me go back to our scores and then I'll go back to um, show you the second iteration. So notice this, this box here. Uh, we will then, we're going to just jump to the next iteration. So you could use that result summary to go back. And this box has some things that, that you might not have, uh, you may not have picked up on. So sometimes when you're iterating, you'll lose sequences that were previously matched. And they're probably because they weren't real or they're right at the border of your threshold. And here you've got some controls of jumping to your first new match or jumping to the threshold. So you can look at sequences around the threshold. So there's this box down the right hand side where you can control which sequences go through to the set, the following iteration. So what we've done is we've done two iterations. The first one picked up uh, about uh, 1,200 sequences. Now we're at 6,000. So that's many, many more sequences from our initial search. Now, if I scroll down, you'll see this green box here behind that sequence succession. That's our first new hit. This uh, you'll see all of these icons here. This giving links. This is a very well characterized sequence. And this is our original query. And we've got actually links to most other resources at the EBI. Right down the bottom is what we refer to as an HMM logo. And this actually shows you uh, the information content or the most probable position. So this might look quite familiar to what I showed you during the presentation of these heights of the different amino acids. And so the high, higher the amino acid, the more probable it is at position. And this is our globins. And here you'll see these histidines that are, are showing quite uh, distinctly as being highly conserved. There's some other residues in there as well. So that's a very quick overview of the um, Hammer web server. You can also download the software by following software, and that takes you to our sister site in the US that's run by Sean Eddy's group, where you can download the software and play with this on the command line. And with that, I'll wrap up and take any questions. Thank you very much for listening. OK, thanks very much, Rob. We do have time for questions. And if you do have questions, please write them in the chat box. Just while you do that, I'm going to switch back to my screen and wrap up with a few extra housekeeping things. So this webinar was part of our regular Wednesday webinar series. And we have a couple more of these before the end of the year. And then we'll start again in February. 
You can find the details about these webinars on the EBI training website. So that's www.ebi.ac.uk forward slash training forward slash webinars. And you can also catch up on all of our previous webinars in Train Online. Once we finish up here today, please don't forget to fill in the survey that launches on your screen. That helps us decide what we're going to include in next year's webinar series, and it helps us make the webinars better as well. Okay, so let's have a look and see if there are any questions. So no questions just at the moment, but we'll wait. Those, those. Oh, okay, so one's coming to Rob directly. Uh, is there any functionality within the hammer package that helps in searching against translated search. So actually there is um, an equivalent. It's actually in a, if you go to GitHub and look for hammer, there is a translated version that allows you to do uh, exactly the same as T blast N. Uh, that, and that's in, that's being produced by Travis, Travis Wheeler. Uh, it's now, it's, it's beyond alpha. So this, initial prototype, it's now undergoing full testing um, and we expect it to be rolled in at some point in the near future. It's a little bit hard to gauge exactly when all of these things will be uh, pushed into the same branch. Um, but you can find that looking for Travis Wheeler and also the GitHub for Hammer. If you have, if, if you need to find out more, uh, please send us an email and I can point you to, to the location of that. Okay, that was the first question. So there's a question about height uh, of the amino acids sort of, and, and frequency. So it, there's a direct relationship between the height of the letter and the number of times it's observed in enlivened. Uh, that's what you observe. It gets some finer adjustments based on your prior, but essentially the more frequently you see an amino acid in a column in alignment, the more likely or the greater the height it's going to be. Okay, what sequence weighting schemes are used uh, and which step of the, of the hammer method? So there's a weighting scheme very similar to uh, the Blossom matrix Blossom 62 matrix uh, that you may know have heard of associated with BLAST. What that's actually done is that's converted into, there's an equivalent that's a set of probabilities, and that's used in P-Hammer. The priors are slightly different, and they're actually based on observed frequencies, and so, what, and so that's how they, those work. They're slightly different to a weighting scheme. Uh, the, uh, or scoring scheme that's used like a blossom matrix. And that's just for fine tuning those uh, probabilities to get to those distantly related uh, sequences. Um, so then there's a, an interesting question about, is there any cross-referencing to data on source subject characteristics, age, gender, sample type? That's a really good question. And the answer up front is no, because for example, human sequence is represented once. So if we take the human myoglobin, it's only represented once. Now you need to go into population studies to really get out that sort of information. Now, where you'd go is you'd probably go from the human sequence out to ensemble and then get to the variation data that way or there's also variation data that's coming in uh, to Uniprop, but that's not something we would show here. Okay, there's lots of questions coming in. Uh, can you help me? Okay, how, how well uh, can Hammer figure out alignment between sequences uh, with larger deletions or insertions? So, it, it does work reasonably well with fairly large inserts and, and deletes. Um, but there's a point where Hammer will uh, decide 
so, so Hammer uses what we refer to as a, a local local matching. So it means that you can match anywhere in the model and anywhere in the sequence. And there's a point where the insert becomes so long that it actually just says there's two partial matches and that's much better. In terms of delete, delete long, long stretches of delete are rarer because they're going to have a very negative impact on your score, whereas an insert is essentially saying skip, skip, skip. So I hope that helps answer that one. Okay, so perhaps we can take one more question and then we'll have to wrap up for today. Um, okay, thanks. The last one. Uh, how well is Hammer to, uh, able to uh, make profiles for viral sequences and which are very diff very divergent uh, to determine distant homology? So, if I understand the question, so you can build profile HMMs of, of viruses. And actually, there's someone in my team at this moment who's a visitor who's working on that. And, he, and what he's doing is, is looking at how we can use those for, for viral classification in the metagenomics world. So we can build, so what you do is those profile HMMs. There are some that are informative and some that are not, i.e. those that can distinguish taxonomy. What we have is a set of representative sequences. And then that's able to go out into data sets and find lots and lots of similar sequences. But they, they do get to the point where we start not being able to, say, use those for classification of, of, of a virus. Viruses are quite difficult because one virus actually tends to look like another virus. And so we, we can detect the distant similarities. Actually, the, our ability to detect those distant similarities makes it very hard for viral classification. So we can pull them out. Um, it all depends on how good your initial set of related sequences are to build your profile HMM. So your, your profile HMM is only as good as your, your initial alignment. Uh, I hope that helps answer that question. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there for today. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us and for all of the interesting questions that you've been asking, Rob. And thanks very much, Rob, for presenting the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope to see you again in another webinar and we will let you know when the recording is available. Enjoy the rest of your day.